So why should you play Poison Scourger Pathfinder? Well, the first reason is you're going to feel like you're wearing a Mage Blood from day one. The second reason is you can level with Poisonous Concoction, which will lead to an absurdly easy leveling experience. Of course, prizes are always relative, so there are times where this might become more meta, thus some of the uniques will go up and some of the rares will go down. Also, for the price and level of investment, this build is an insanely good mapper. It's maybe not quite headhunter fast, but it will certainly feel like you have both a mageblood and a headhunter from the perspective of playing it. Furthermore, you have very good mapping defenses via leveraging Fizz Taken As and Elemental Flasks. In addition, if you want to do some bossing, the boss damage is quite solid with the Covenant. And if you're thinking, well, this is all too good to be true, what's the catch? The catch is you have to use Ballistas for your single target, and Scourge Arrow is a somewhat particular skill mechanic-wise. Now, normally in my build showcases, this is where I'd start talking about the skill mechanics, but I feel Scourge Arrow's mechanics are honestly a little bit complex for that. So if you like the look of this, and if you want to play the build, I strongly suggest you click through the card and check out my dedicated Scourge Arrow mechanics video, as that will explain it much better than I can here, as I don't really want to repeat things too much. If you are already somewhat familiar with how Scourge Arrow works and want a quick TLDR, aim for two projectiles. If you want to do single target damage, aim really close to yourself. If you want to clear the screen, aim really far away. If all you care about is just clearing the screen, then you don't need two projectiles. It's just kind of nice to have for single target. But of course, just a skill does not a build make. So what are some of the other mechanics that this build leverages? The first is the Pathfinder Ascendancy. And you might be thinking, that's just for Master Toxicist, right? In some senses, yes, the Poison Perlif for Master Toxicist, along with a 20% chance to deal 100% more damage, is very nice. But something else that's also very nice, and quite honestly understated a lot of the time, is Nature's Boon. This causes flasks to gain 3 charges every 3 seconds. In combination with a couple of other flask nodes on the tree, it means that this build can quite comfortably have 100% uptime on flasks. So if you want to cap your resists using your flasks, it's no problem. Resistance flasks in particular are super easy to get up and running since they only require 20 charges and last about 10 seconds by default. So it's super easy to fit in something like a Taste of Hate, which is great since this build leverages Fizz Taken As. And having the extra layer of elemental defense means you don't need to worry so much about having max res, which is quite nice. But of course, elemental damage isn't the only damage you take. So to deal with chaos damage, the build leverages Divine Flesh. Divine Flesh gives 50% of elemental damage taken as chaos. This isn't actually hugely beneficial since we're already pretty resistant to elemental damage, though it certainly doesn't hurt, and 5% to max chaos res, which is important because the build also leverages a Fizz taken as setup to completely avoid taking physical damage. If you want, I also have a dedicated video explaining this more. The short version is, I combine Dark Scorn, which is Scourge Arrow's best in slot bow, 25% of Fizz taken as chaos with Lightning Coil, a very nice unique chess piece that offers 50% of Fizz taken as Lightning. Now, 75% of physical damage is taken as non-Fizz. To finish things off, it's a Taste of Hate with a Flask effect in combination with a Watcher's Eye, though I don't think I actually need the Fizz taken as on the Watcher's Eye. A couple percent of Fizz damage probably wouldn't kill me anyway, but I happened to pick up a really nice Watcher's Eye with everything else that I wanted plus the Fizz taken as, so I figure might as well use it. On the other hand, if you want to do bossing, or especially uber bossing, you'll probably want the Covenant as your chess piece, since it almost doubles your single target damage. The reason that I don't advise using this at all times, dealing with the additional life cost kind of sucks, and you don't really need that much damage when mapping. Even with my Lightning Coil, I was able to tear through map bosses without any issues. The build also uses Devouring Diadem, something that is quite honestly more of a holdover from my Poisonous Concoction Pathfinder, but I really like how Diadem plays, and it does let us fit in all of our auras. Especially if you're using one small cluster for the additional Malevolence Reservation. You could instead go for Divine Blessing setup, I just hate how Divine Blessing plays, and we already have enough totems to juggle so more temporary buffs just gets annoying. Then finally, to round out the build's uniques, I'm also using Circle of Nostalgia, and combining it with alt-quality Herald of Agony. Normally, Herald of Agony grants you a 20% chance to poison on hit, Divergent doubles this to 40%, although it will scale with quality. This is important because the build uses Siege Ballista for its single target rather than a poison skill. Siege Ballista does not have a very high innate chance to poison the enemy, so to get it to 100%, using something like Divergent Herald of Agony is one of the best ways to go. 
and you then combine that with poison nodes on the tree. If you're going to be using Herald of Agony anyway, I strongly recommend a Circle of Nostalgia. You can get some nice implicits like attack speed, plus increased chaos damage while affected and increased chaos res while affected, which makes it a lot easier to get to positive 80% chaos res. And yes, you heard that correctly, I'm using Siege Ballista, or more accurately, Anomalous Siege Ballista for the two additional projectiles, over Scourge Arrow Ballista. The reason for this is, Ballista Totems are not very smart with how they work. So personally, I've always found Siege Ballista to be a lot more efficient than a skill like Scourge Arrow that has positional requirements and requires careful aiming. In a lot of cases, Scourge Arrow Ballistas will do just fine. The big issue comes when the Ballista tries to channel up to 5 stacks and ends up dead before it ever fires. On the other hand, Siege Ballista will fire almost immediately, and after it fires, if it dies afterwards, you can always resummon another one with only some annoyance. I say some because, quite honestly, the only thing I don't like about this build is the fact that my Ballistas can die. Everything else I'm super happy with, the defenses felt great, and the damage while clearing felt superb. It is smooth as butter to just watch entire screens melt, and quite honestly, if the density is high enough, the next screen over will melt as well because the poison prolifs very nicely. So let's get into the gearing just a little bit more. For the weapon, I'm of course using Darkscorn, and I do feel this is your best option. The 20% chance for poisons inflicted with this weapon to deal 300% more damage is basically just a deal 60% more damage with poison modifier. And if it was just about damage alone, you honestly could probably get away with a better rare that offers more raw damage. However, it gives 25% of physical damage from hits taken as chaos damage, which is the equivalent of an 80% true fizz mitigation. And so far, there's no way to get that on a rare. Though, again, if all you care about is damage, maybe you're focusing on uber bossing where most of the hits are probably not fizz, and many of the hits might kill you anyway if you don't dodge then I could definitely see switching to a rare, as at the top end that will be more damage, especially if you can get additional projectiles on it. Though that will also be a lot more expensive than a Darkscorn. Do be sure to corrupt your Darkscorn using a Krakic Vassal to get 30% quality for that bit of extra damage. Next up we have the Quiver. Now, mine has bow attacks fire an additional arrow with damage over time multiplier and maximum life. I forget exactly how I crafted it, but I believe it was with Fossils. That said, there's actually quite a bit of flexibility here. Since this build leverages Scourge Arrow primarily as a clear skill rather than a single target skill, the additional arrow isn't necessarily as critical. Though the additional arrow does mean more barraged projectiles for your single target, so it's not bad to have either. But you could go with something like a Damage Over Time Chaos Damage Over Time Multiplier Quiver, which would be a Hunter base, again likely rolled with Fossils. Or you could go with something that has increased damage with bow skills, flat damage, max life, Whatever you get, I would very strongly advise either having a high attack speed roll or crafted attack speed, and aim for a vile quiver base for a 15% of fizz as extra chaos. But other than that, you have quite a bit of flexibility in terms of the actual mods on the item. Now, I've already covered the helmet, body, and one ring, so I'm going to skip over those, and instead talk about the gloves and the boots. In a lot of ways, the gloves and the boots are pretty interchangeable. Personally, I ended up needing one spell suppression roll, and I also needed chaos res on both. This might not be the case depending on your gearing. For example, if you have a really juicy Chaos Res roll on your ring, you might not need it on both your gloves and your boots. The things to look for though would be one Spell Suppression roll, and if you can get it, either Accuracy or Attack Speed on gloves. I ended up getting both, but that was just kind of lucky on my part. One thing that's quite nice that you can do is take a Fractured Base and Reforge Speed to get Attack Speed, since there aren't too many other rolls that can show up, and if you happen to hit something like Tier 1 Accuracy, then you're in luck. For the Boots, one of the best things to do is just spam Essence of Envy for Chaos Res, and hope you hit something else relevant along the way. If you need to fix the prefixes in either case, it's quite easy to do with Suffixes Can't Be Changed plus Veiled Chaos. Or, in my case, I didn't even do that, and I was just super lazy and used them as is with crafted move speed, because that was good enough. For the amulet, I just happened to buy mine. I'm using it for life, stat fixing, and some damage over time multiplier. If I really wanted to min-max my damage, I'd probably get something like non-chaos as extra chaos, in combination with damage over time multiplier, or maybe just a big juicy lake rolled damage over time multiplier mod. But I needed the int and I wanted the life, so this is what I ended up with, and honestly, I can't really complain. The build works really well, and I'm able to equip most of the items that I wanted to. A little bit more on that later. Now, I already covered one of my rings. For the other, I have a Hunter Vermilion ring. 
This was made by spamming Harvest Reforge Caster. Yes, that's right, Curse on Hit mods are caster tag, so your options are cast speed, despair on hit, and Ellie weak on hit. I just repeated that until I ended up with something that had pretty good lightning res, and also pretty good max life. Then I sold all the ones that didn't roll what I wanted for a quite solid profit. It should be noted the poison duration mod on my ring says it does kind of a lot in POB, in reality it's not all that impactful, and if you're running into some mana cost issues, say because you're not using diadem, you could easily use minus mana cost of chinling skills here, as opposed to the chaos to attacks. Then we have the belt. On my belt, I wanted maximum life, increased maximum life, and regenerate maximum life. Having a little bit of regen felt really good once I started using the covenant, and even outside the covenant, it meant that if I took minor damage, I didn't really have to worry about hitting my life flask immediately. On top of all this, any sort of flask mod would have been nice but wasn't required. So I took a bunch of pristine fossils and started throwing them at Stygian hunter vices. During the process, I ended up making a couple stacks of divines, selling things like a percent attribute high life one, and another one that just had really good all around stats plus chaos damage. Ultimately, this is the belt I settled on. It's not quite perfect, the life could be a little bit higher, but it had everything else I wanted and a usable open suffix, so it was certainly good enough for me to continue to use, and not worry too much beyond that. Like with a lot of my recent previous builds, I wanted to make sure I was using Purity of Elements. It's not that Purity of Elements is strictly mandatory, but it did feel really really nice to not have to worry about elemental ailments or even alt ailments. And that mostly covers the basics, both in terms of how the build works and also how the gearing works. If you found this useful so far, do be sure to leave it a like, and if your friend's looking for a really fast off-meta mapper, do share the video with them. At this point, if you're wondering where the POB is and why it's not down in the description, I found that often when I include POBs in my description, people will grab the POB without watching the video, and then write a long essay about how this is the worst build they've ever played, it's completely terrible, and the POB left out something really important. Usually something that I spend multiple minutes in the video talking about. And beyond that, I don't think just grabbing and copying a POB is a good practice. My goal is always to give you as much information about how a skill or a build works, rather than just saying, here's a template, go copy it. So as a result, I put the POB here, it's been on screen, feel free to grab it if you want to try out the build, and feel free to adapt and change things to suit your taste. That said, if you want more content, such as some thoughts on other action RPGs, get subscribed as that'll be coming out soon. If you want something on other games more immediately, then you can click through the card to check out my second channel, 10 Gaming Thoughts, where I talk about a wider variety of topics. Before I get back to talking about the mechanics though, a special thanks to my patrons and channel members for the support. More about how you can support at the end. So one mechanic that I ended up including, which felt really good, was Grace. Normally, I don't value evasion very much. This is because you need some level of mitigation to stop the damage that gets through your evasion from killing you. However, with the Elemental Flasks, the Divine Flesh, and the Fizz Taken As, this build has mitigation to spare. What it's lacking on is recovery. And so evasion actually works very well while mapping to make sure I don't take too many hits back to back. Because I've capped spell suppression, spells will hurt a little bit, but generally not enough to kill me. I can always life flask through them. And while attacks would probably be much the same, due to how common attacks are, this lets me play recklessly and run into a group of enemies without feeling like I'm going to fall over. If you don't have a diadem and you're struggling for mana reservation, grace would absolutely be the thing to drop, since purity of elements is simply too much value, both from a res perspective saving you on suffixes on gear, and also from a never having to deal with ailments perspective. One other important mechanical note, the reason I'm taking the claw mastery while using bows is not from some weird way to scale my damage, it's because the mastery enemies poisoned by you cannot deal critical strikes is just really nice as a defensive layer. It would probably be more damage to take something else, I'm perfectly fine with giving up a little bit of damage to have a lot more defenses. And finally, I didn't heavily build into ballistas, but if you wanted to, you could actually anoint panopticon and allocate watchtowers. This would mean that instead of summoning 4 siege ballistas, you'll summon up to 6, which would be a massive single target boost to a build, at the cost of a bit more quality of life, and at that point you probably want to use multi-totem support, which ultimately puts it at roughly the same DPS. The reason that I'm not using focus ballista support is I have to attack myself for the ballistas to fire in that case. Because I'm using Scourge Arrow, there is no way that my attack time and the ballista attack time are even going to remotely sync up, so I'll end up actually losing a lot of damage, especially as I dodge mechanics. 
Usually, Focus Ballista works really well when you absolutely massively overwhelm an outgear of a content. So I could absolutely fit it in if I wanted to kill some trivial bosses even faster, but it would be a very poor choice on something like uber bosses, where the build already runs into a couple of issues. And this brings me to my biggest problem with a build and bossing. It's not a problem unique to this build, it's something that's shared by every ballista build. That is, that uber bosses kind of just murder ballistas, unless you have heavy investment into them. So, can it kill uber bosses? Yes, I did a couple of them, but I absolutely do not advise this build if your only goal is to farm uber bosses. For that, I still think the best build in the game is my cast on crit strike forbidden right build, which I played last league and back in 316. On the other hand, if you want a mapping build that feels absolutely incredible, is reasonably tanky, and can blow all the other bosses away in a couple of seconds, then this build is superb. Forget clearing one screen away. You can sometimes clear things two screens away with Poison Prolith. And despite not being a particularly meta choice of mapper right now, Poison Scourge Arrow Pathfinder feels very close to what you'd get if you took a Headhunter Tornado Shot build and somehow also stuck a Mage Blood on it. Really, the only downside is your single target damage can die, and it feels really bad to be sitting there spamming Ballista and then losing damage uptime while you're dodging boss mechanics. In some cases, yes, having focus Ballista will help with that if you can absolutely instigate the boss during your focus. But otherwise, it's going to feel pretty bad because you'll fire a couple times, and as you do, all your Ballistas will die while not doing any damage until you stop to fire again. One other note, I was using Mirage Archer a lot because it felt incredibly good when clearing. It meant I could fire and then kind of just run around looting and my Mirage Archer would kill the next screen for me. But if you don't enjoy the playstyle of Mirage Archer, you could easily drop it for another damage link, which would shift things a little bit away from your Siege Ballistas doing all your single target and a little bit more towards Scourge Arrow doing your single target. If you want Scourge Arrow to do your single target, the Helmet Enchant for plus one pod is very important. If you're just using it for clear, honestly, you could go with whatever else you want, such as a Reservation Enchantment to again not have to use the small cluster. Scourge Arrow is a build that I've enjoyed quite a lot in the past, and I wanted to play it again. I know it's not the most popular thing right now, but I do think it has a really solid place in Path of Exile, both as a speedy mapper and just as an enjoyable build with reasonable defenses. It might take a little bit of tweaking, but I also think this is one of the more hardcore friendly bow builds that I've played in quite a while. I know very often bow builds tend to lean heavily into the glass cannon, this one definitely does not. And despite not having any armor, it's able to deal with physical damage incredibly well due to taking 100% of fizz as non-fizz. So the only question remains, have you played Scourge Arrow in the past? And if so, are you going to play it again? Let me know your favorite version of Scourge Arrow down in the comments below. A special thanks to my patrons and YouTube channel members. Your support helps keep me independent and allows me to turn down things like sketchy mobile game sponsorships. You can do so for as low as $1 a month over on Patreon. Or if you want to support me completely for free, then you can join the community by hopping into my Discord, link below. If you want more content, check out my second channel, 10 Gaming Thoughts. It's a place that I use to review games, ramble my way through video essays, and a lot more. Or of course, you can just click the suggested video in the card right now. I hope you learned something today, and maybe I'll see you again sometime soon.